Hello everyone and welcome to episode 4 of WrestleBook Review. My name is Keith, I am the Well-Read Machine, and as always I can be found on Twitter at WrestleBookReview, that's R-E-V-U. You can visit my website, it's WrestleBookReview.blogspot.com. You can find me on Facebook, just do a search for WrestleBook Review, that's easiest. And you can always email me at WrestleBookReview at gmail.com. And the WrestleBook Review Podcast is a proud member of the OSW Podcast Network, available at PileDriverWrestling.net. Come on by to PileDriverWrestling.net to hear this and many other podcasts that cover a wide range of professional wrestling topics. And check out the growing and very friendly community boards. Now I'm going to be stepping a little bit out of my comfort zone, and a little bit out of the mandate of this show as well, to discuss Ronda Rousey's 2015 My Fight, Your Fight. The book is co-written with journalist Maria Burns Ortiz. It was published by Reagan Books and is available on hardcover and ebook. And a audio version of the book is forthcoming. The book is currently on the New York Times bestseller list and has been on a number of the Amazon.com bestseller lists since its release. For pure pro wrestling fans who don't follow MMA, uh, most of you would be familiar with Ronda Rousey for her appearance this past year at WrestleMania, wherein she kicked the shit out of Stephanie McMahon and uh, Triple H. But most folks are most familiar with her for her run in the UFC. She is the first and current holder of the Women's Bantamweight Championship, and as of this recording has a record of 11-0 and in her pro MMA career. Prior to going into MMA, she was an Olympic bronze medalist in judo at the Beijing Games and had participated at the Athens Games as well, and was a multiple-time medalist in uh, amateur competition. Her success has caused her to become something of a crossover celebrity into entertainment. She appeared in The Expendables 3 and has done some uh, advertising, as well as appearing on the cover of Sports Illustrated. There are a number of unofficial or unauthorized biographies of Rousey on the market, and though some of them are fairly good and have received a lot of uh, praise, it's great to hear Rousey's story in her own words. She frequently credits her success to her hard work and determination. And those qualities certainly seem to be present as she was working on the book with, uh, with her co-author. Each chapter begins with a chapter title, of course, but after which is a, an inspirational passage that literally applies to MMA, fighting, but is a very thinly veiled metaphor for life's struggles as well. While one who's typically not a fan of motivational speeches in books, and I tend to shun the whole self-help genre, I found these passages very interesting, as well as extremely applicable to the chapter which followed. Rousey's story is certainly very unique as well. Having lost her father at a young age and moving quite a distance across the country with her mother, who was also a successful judo competitor, and her two sisters, Rousey developed a very strong work ethic and a drive and a determination to succeed in the world of judo. The book follows her through her adolescence as she was training and competing on the world stage through her appearances at the Athens and Beijing Olympics, and into her MMA career with Strike Force and the Ultimate Fighting Championship. While in some cases the book could be seen as a very good but still typical sports biography, Rousey's perspective as an extremely successful and trailblazing personality in combat sports makes the book very unique. It really comes across as being extremely honest, at times self-deprecating, and whereas Rousey is is still quite young and her career is only at its peak, I found myself, especially towards the end of the book, looking forward to future books. If you're interested in this sort of thing, Rousey also shares a lot of her training techniques uh, and both physical and mental preparation leading up to her MMA fights. And though I am in no way, shape, or form a successful MMA fighter or a successful MMA trainer, I can see some people that are in the game potentially getting some good tips out of this book. I can see some people having some serious issues with uh, how Rousey was treated by the adults in her life, especially after she chose to pursue judo on a more serious basis. The vast majority of her adolescent life was spent preparing for competition, and not all was under the warmest and fuzziest of circumstances. If you're someone who believes adolescence should have a very rounded upbringing that blends learning with fun or work and play, you may have some serious issues with this. It brings up a whole issue of training of young amateur athletes that 
can't be resolved by one person in a 15-minute podcast. The tone of Rousey's book evokes the thought that she feels that all the time she put in training and preparing for competition has enabled her to develop and maintain a very strong work ethic, which has been the reason for a lot of her success. The book is well written, it's very funny, it's open, it's honest. She's critical of those in her personal and professional life that she feels did not always have her best interest at heart. And it's one of the rare books that shows both a hard edge and a very soft side to the author. I recommend the book to all MMA fans. And as there is a possibility that sometime in the future Ronda Rousey may return to a WWE ring, I recommend it to wrestling fans as well. With the cancellation or non-renewal of TNA Impact and the future of total non-stop action again being a little questionable, I thought I'd take the opportunity to discuss TNA co-founder Jerry Jarrett's 2004 book, The Story of the Development of NWA TNA, A New Concept in Pay-Per-View Programming. The book was written by longtime Memphis wrestling promoter Jerry W. Jarrett, was released in 2004, and is available on paperback. The book was published by Trafford Publishing. Though it was published in 2004, this book is actually Jerry Jarrett's 2002 diary, with all the non-wrestling stuff edited out. It's an interesting look at the early, early days of TNA. When we joined Jarrett on January 1st, 2002, TNA is still in the planning stage. If I recall correctly, the original idea for TNA was pitched on a fishing trip with Jerry, Jarrett, Jeff Jarrett, Bob Ryder, and Jeremy Borash. This book begins after that event. The book is a day-by-day chronicle of all the developments concerning the lead-up to the first show, following through to the writing of About Show 20. There's a couple of strong elements to this book. First off, Jerry Jarrett is one of the most successful promoters in U.S. wrestling history. His uh, USWA, which was an amalgamation of his continental CWA Memphis and World Class Championship Wrestling, which he, he bought out. It was the last major U.S. territory to go out of business after the McMahon expansion of the 1980s. While most of them only survived till about 88, 89, 90, Jarrett was able to go till 96 or 97 before finally getting out with out being financially destitute. He later went into the construction business and and found great success there as well. As well, the book is a diary, so it's a day-by-day account. You know, much like uh, Bret Hart's book or Mick Foley's book, where they both kept journals for so long. Um, Jarrett's giving us a day-by-day account, essentially in real time. One thing that really stood out was the sheer amount of, of work that went into the promotion before it even shot its first show. Jarrett, along with his son Jeff and, and a few others, hit the ground running and are constantly working on deals with talents and distributors and marketing groups and pay-per-view companies. And he details all these business dealings very effectively. TNA began as a weekly pay-per-view company that didn't have a television deal. Jarrett's book gives us an inside look at blazing this trail as well. And though it wasn't as successful as, as Jarrett hoped or thought it might be, it still makes for interesting reading. There is a fair bit of conflict in the book. On one hand, you have Jerry Jarrett's conflict with his own son Jeff regarding the business direction and creative direction of the company, some of that centering around Vince Russo and the role he should have within the company. Also between the Jarretts and a agent who was sort of a middleman between TNA and one of the pay-per-view providers, who provided uh, incorrect information that ultimately resulted in a, in a lawsuit. For anyone who is thinking of starting a promotion, or anyone who wonders why a viable alternative to the WWE, a second national promotion, didn't just crop up out of nowhere when WCW went under, This book will provide a lot of insight into how much work it actually takes to even scratch the surface of that goal. The book also brings up a lot of philosophical questions regarding old-school thought versus new-school thought, and Jerry Jarrett, a proponent of the old school, for, for good reason, as he was very successful, makes a strong case for traditional thought when promoting and developing pro wrestling angle stories etc. The diehard proponents of the new way of promoting will simply not agree with. I found the major highlight of the book to be a letter Jerry Jarrett wrote to a representative of Panda Energy who were just beginning to acquire TNA as the book comes to a close about perception in the wrestling business and how important perception, both fan perception and perception of those within the industry, how important that truly is. Will fans support a company they think is going to go under? Will people want to work at a company 
that they perceive will be going under? Will they work hard at a company that they think might not be around in two weeks, two months, or even a year or two? And that letter in many ways details precisely what has plagued TNA since its inception. One thing I really enjoyed about the book as well was watching the ebb and flow of Jarrett's passion and his excitement level as the company crossed a hurdle or hit a minor setback. Here was a guy who was celebrating his 60th birthday who thought he was free and clear from the pro wrestling industry uh, a few years before, and watching him and reading his words as he was excited about the prospect or as he was or as he was getting disillusioned by some setbacks. As well, it's really interesting reading about the dynamic between Jerry and Jeff. The book has its flaws as well. First and foremost, there was a shameful amount of typos and grammar mistakes. It really doesn't look like this book was proofread at all. If it was, whoever did it should have been fired immediately. It's uh, it's terrible. Secondly, there are moments where people are referred to just by their name. There's no real context of who they are. Now, it's it's possible that editing had eliminated some of the context, but regardless, we are simply hearing names being thrown out without any other information. and causes some confusion. A few times I found myself wondering who the hell he was talking about and not being able to pay attention to the story he was actually telling. Thirdly, it's just the overall structure of the book. It's, it's a journal of a year, January 1st to December 31st. In most cases, our lives are not organized in such a way that we begin a journey on January 1st and conclude the same journey on December 31st. So instead of following the Jarrett's into, say for example, their first show or the acquisition of TNA by Panda Energy or their first pay-per-view supercard, there's no real climax in the book. We have a lot of little ups and downs, but it doesn't build to any big crescendo. And while that's not always possible in non-fiction, a lot of the time the story can be told in such a way that it does build to something. As the book begins, TNA is an idea in the planning stage, and, and as it ends, it's sort of in the final stages of its closing to Panda Energy. Though there is something to be said for doing one calendar year, and I can understand why people would think that was a good idea, you almost wish that the boundaries were extended to the famous fishing trip where they conceive the idea to maybe even the sale to Panda Energy. I recommend this book to anyone who's a fan of the Jarrett's, or anyone even on the indie level who's thinking of starting a promotion. Certainly, if you have an interest in Tennessee wrestling history, this would be on your reading list. And, of course, if you're a TNA fan. And while I think that most wrestling fans benefit by reading almost any wrestling book, this one would be one that, though it's interesting, this one might be one that a lot of fans would naturally choose to pass up. And while I enjoyed this book, I certainly wouldn't go as far as to block a Twitter follower who disagreed with my opinion. So that will be it for today on WrestleBook Review. Thank you very much for listening to Episode 4. Just a reminder, I am away from the internet now. This episode was pre-recorded on the 6th of June. And if you just happen to email me or send me a message, it might take a day or two for me to get back to you. As of today, there are no major changes to the upcoming release list. So on that, thank you very much for listening to WrestleBook Review. Have yourselves a good day. Take care.